Hi, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Quick Takes live stream of Taiwan's presidential inauguration. I'm Kurmi Mori, and joining us live is Lev Nachman, who studies social movements and party politics in Taiwan and Hong Kong. Thanks for coming on, Lev. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So for uh, those of you watching, send us any questions you may have, and we'll try to get them answered from Lev throughout this broadcast. Uh, we are listening in um, on now the last few minutes of President Tsai Ing-wen's inaugural address. She was first elected in a landslide victory in 2016 and was re-elected early this year while her Democratic Progressive Party, or the DPP, retained control of the legislature. So as she wraps up her address, uh, Lev, can you talk us through some of the main points she touched on today? So... Uh there was kind of, I see, three main topics that she talked about. The first, of course, is Taiwan's handling uh, of the COVID pandemic that the entire world is going through. Um, I think it was really smart for her to really emphasize just how well Taiwan has handled uh, the entire pandemic domestically, but also more importantly, highlighting how much uh, Taiwan has helped internationally uh, and reminding citizens that this is a really uh, prideful moment for Taiwan because they've been able to be such a global player and uh, because Taiwan's been able to contribute in so many positive ways. Um, what I especially liked is how she started off the entire uh, kind of section of talking about the pandemic by thanking citizens for their patience with uh, how Taiwan rolled out its uh, policies in terms of mask distribution uh, and thanked people who had to go to quarantine uh, for their patience and for understanding and highlighting how uh, Taiwan's civil society has been so accommodating uh, and how she's very grateful for, for that. Um, the, the second uh, major point that I thought was interesting was her discussion of the military. Uh, so she emphasized something that I thought was really important, which is kind of to acknowledge that there are problems in Taiwan's military institutions and there's problems with kind of uh, the public's view of the military, which is something that I think um, in Taiwan is something that's needed to be addressed for a while. Uh, and she said that she's going to try to do more to try to kind of raise the image of the military while also acknowledging that there's a lot of kind of imperfect institutions in the military. Um, and that's, uh, you know, talks of improving Taiwan's cybersecurity, improving the military's capabilities uh, as kind of the goals going forward in the next four years um, was also, I think, a very um, smart move. And then finally, uh, she addressed uh, cross strait issues very briefly. I mean, she, she said before this speech, uh, I think a few days ago, that uh, she already announced that she was not going to actually have any substantive changes to her cross strait policy, which is, as she said in her life, uh, in, her, uh, in her speech, that she's going to adhere to the ROC constitution, the Republic of China constitution, and not do anything to upset the status quo, um, which is what the DPP stance has been and what Tsai Ing-wen's stance has been since she got into uh, office in 2016. Mm -hmm. I think those are kind of the three big takeaways I, I have from, from her address. Okay, great. So ties between Taiwan and the US have been the strongest of the same decades. Could you mm -hmm. talk about a little bit of, about what is behind, behind the strengthening ties between the US and Taiwan? So uh, Taiwan and the US have always been allies for a very long time. Uh, I think it's important to to note that there was never like a bad time for U.S.-Taiwan relations. Um, but but you're totally right to point out that right now it's the best it's been in a long time uh, because there's becoming more and more dialogue between the U.S. and Taiwan and because there's more and more trade uh, going on between the U.S. and Taiwan. Just yesterday there was an announcement about Taiwan's one of its biggest uh, um, uh, semiconductor uh, or, um companies opening up a base in uh, a factory in the U.S., which is a very big deal. Um, and something like that would have been unheard of years ago, uh, or how there's more dialogue between uh, U.S. and ta uh, Taiwan military now more than ever. Um, and I think it's a couple of things. So first, uh, the pandemic has most certainly uh, shown how capable Taiwan can be as a partner. Um, and I think, I, I think a lot of the idea of wanting to have closer ties with Taiwan does come from a very positive place of seeing Taiwan as a capable partner. Um, but uh, at the same time, I think another big part of why the U.S. is trying to uh, elevate its relationship with Taiwan is because of conflict with China. So the U.S. wants to use Taiwan as a wedge between uh, its relationship with China and use Taiwan in a way that can both help Taiwan, but also 
um, shows kind of uh, to the PRC that uh, Taiwan is not going to simply be kind of a neutral um, kind of actor between uh, their relationship. Right. And do you think that'll continue, the stronger ties? Do you think that'll continue no matter who the next U.S. president is? Uh, I do. I think you can look at something like the Taipei Act that just passed, um, I think, a month ago, less than now. Uh, that was a totally bipartisan uh, bill. So uh, the Taipei Act said that, there, that the U.S. was committed to strengthening ties with Taiwan, that it was going to help Taiwan gain access to international organizations, uh, and that it was going to increase uh, military cooperation between uh, Taiwan and the U.S. And that bill was, uh, there were more Democrats that voted in favor uh, than Republicans, although it was still completely um, unanimous, unanimous show, show of support. So, so you know, whoever the president is at the end of this year in the U.S., uh, I think there, uh, there, there is good reason to think that ties between the U.S. and Taiwan will still uh, maintain their strength. So we mentioned a little bit, um, you mentioned a little bit about China. Um, so what are some widely held misconceptions about Taiwan and its relationship with China that you think need clearing up? So there's a couple uh, important ones. I, I think the one that you see the most is just through simple language uh, and media rhetoric. Uh, and it's one uh, that you often see uh, called reunification. Uh, and when you see reunification, it's a little bit misleading because the People's Republic of China, the PRC, has never actually governed Taiwan, the ROC. So historically, uh, after the, the Chinese Civil War, the ROC fled to Taiwan. And before the ROC fled to Taiwan, um, Taiwan was a part of the ROC. And before it was a part of the ROC, it was a colony of Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, but when the PRC was founded um, in uh, 1949, it never actually had uh, any sort of governing authority over Taiwan and still never has. So when you see things like reunification or you see Taiwan described as a renegade province, it's misleading because that kind of infers that Taiwan was once a province of the R of the PRC, when in fact that's never been the case. Got it. Okay. Is there any other, are there any other misconceptions that we really should be talking about? Yeah. So I think another really important one uh, that Tsai Ing-wen herself uh, brought up in uh, her inauguration speech is the idea that uh, she and her party are pro-independence uh, or that she herself is trying to actively make Taiwan on a sovereign country under the name the country of Taiwan. Uh, and that's kind of a narrative that China pushes about the DPP. Um, and it's misleading because, as you just heard her say, her cross-strait policy is completely tied to the Republic of China constitution. And she herself has no intention of trying to threaten the status quo uh, or threaten uh, Taiwan's kind of uh, de facto independence uh, by pushing for some sort of de jure independence that would be a very, that would likely be seen as very risky. Um, so rather than describe Tsai one of the DPP as pro-independence, uh, I think, as you just heard her say in her speech, I think pro-status quo is a much more accurate way to describe uh, her and her party's policy. Uh, and the reason that really matters is because the more that we kind of consider the DPP or its eyeing one to be pro-independence, it kind of leads into how the PRC wants us to see them as these kind of radical troublemakers who are trying to uh, throw off balance in East Asia. And that's really not true. Tsai Ing-wen mm -hmm. has uh, been very pragmatic with her cross-strait policy, and it's because she adheres to uh, the status quo. So let's talk a little bit more about President Tsai. I mean, she became the first female president uh, of Taiwan in 2016, now going into her second term. She probably identifies herself as a cat lady, right? So what is her appeal to the large portions of the Taiwanese public? I mean, I, I think she's managed to win over a large majority of young voters. So what is, what is her appeal? <laughs> Absolutely. So, so the, the, the cat lady thing totally helps. Uh, and, and, you know, for what it's worth for dog people out there, she has dogs, too. She's actually a, a very equal uh, when it comes to, to, to pets. She, I think she has two I dogs and three cats. Um, but, you know, during the election season, she had, you know, just massive billboard campaigns of her holding her cat, uh, which, like, where else in the world does a politician get elected with that as, as, a, as an actual campaign poster? But, but to really look at her popularity, you have to kind of go back to the 2020 election, which I know for a lot of people seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, but back in January, uh, she was running against the Chinese Nationalist Party, the KMT's candidate, Hong Guoyu. And 
he was such a unpopular choice for most Taiwanese voters that it was so easy to decide to pick Tsai. Um, essentially, not only was Tsai the less bad candidate, but she was so much better at presenting herself that she actually seemed like a really good candidate, even to a lot of voters who might not, not necessarily have been as excited about her in years past. Um, it was definitely a major victory for Tsai, but it's also important to note that the DPP, Tsai Ing-wen's party, did not actually have the same success as she did. So their party actually, because the Taiwan's electoral system is a little bit complicated, and I won't go too into all the details, but essentially you get to vote for whatever party you like most and whatever candidate you like most. Uh, and the party votes were actually about the same as the KMT. So the DPP did kind of just as well as the KMT. But when it came to presidential candidates, Tsai Ing-wen obviously was uh, the favorite candidate. Right. So another maybe landslide for this for this election. Um, for those of you joining us now, watching us, please send us any questions you may have and we'll try to get them answered. I'm Kirby Mori and I'm here with Lev Nachman, who studies social movements and party politics in Taiwan and Hong Kong. So thanks, guys, for watching. All right, Lev, next question. What's the overriding um, public sentiment surrounding national identity in Taiwan? So do people see themselves as Taiwanese or Chinese or maybe both? What's your view on this? So in Taiwan, the most important issue is always going to kind of be this uh, existential crisis about what is Taiwan's relationship with China. Uh, and it kind of manifests in two different ways. First, about how we feel about sovereignty, about this question of independence and unification. Uh, but also very importantly is what you just uh, talked about is how people identify. Uh, and there's been long-term surveys looking at this question for, for decades now, uh, looking at the trends in pe whether or not people feel Taiwanese, Chinese, or a mix of both. Uh, and increasingly, uh, you see more and more people identifying as only Taiwanese, not Taiwanese and Chinese, uh, and especially not just Chinese. So mm -hmm. a recent Pew survey just came out, I think a week ago, uh, which so there's really, really good recent data about this that shows 70% of Taiwanese, uh, based off their survey, identify as only Taiwanese, 30% identifying as uh, Taiwanese and Chinese. And I think there was less than uh, 4% identifying as only Chinese. So hardly anyone in Taiwan identifies as exclusively Chinese, not Taiwanese. The far uh, majority of people identify as just Taiwanese, but there is still a sizable uh, number who identifies as both Taiwanese and Chinese. Right, and I saw you actually tweet that out when it came out. So was that surprising to you, seeing those statistics? No, um, it wasn't because we've actually been seeing uh, those numbers in polls done in Taiwan for a long time. The reason the Pew survey was very cool is because uh, we often don't see those numbers reported in a non-Taiwanese uh, um, kind of survey company. So there's been a long-term study of identity in Taiwan by a lot of different polls, and they all show the same direction. They all show an increasing number of people who exclusively identify as Taiwanese, not Chinese. Um, and more and more people who uh, don't identify as Chinese at all. Um, and it's nice to have this data. The one, the one caveat, and I, and I said this uh, when I tweeted out the survey, is that it was actually done right before the pandemic, which is uh, too bad because a couple of surveys have been done since the pandemic started. And we've actually seen that those numbers of who identifies as only Taiwanese, not Chinese, have actually gone up since the pandemic started. Does that relate to how uh, Taiwan has been handling the COVID-19 a pandemic? Um, it's hard to say what exactly is causing it for certain, but I think it is very difficult to deny that the pandemic has most certainly pushed Taiwanese people to feel more Taiwanese, uh, and especially given uh, China's handling uh, of the pandemic and the and kind of the increasing pressure that China has tried to put on Taiwan, especially with things like the WHO. Uh, I think that's also incentivized people to feel more Taiwanese and less Chinese just in, even in the last few months. Speaking of the COVID-19 response, the presidential office said today's inauguration would be a short and simple version of the ceremony because of the pandemic. Um, Taiwan's coronavirus response has been touted to be among the best globally, right? We've been seeing in news headlines that Taiwan's doing such a great job. What's the situation like around now? You live in Taiwan. Uh, life is really back to normal. Uh, it's almost kind of... Uh, 
uh, strange to live in a place that is totally operational, that we can go out to restaurants, we can travel around the country, go to parks, uh, et cetera, uh, and watching kind of the rest of the world still um, trying to get a hand on the current situation. Um, Taiwan actually just announced a few days ago what the rollouts are going to be for reopening even more so. So currently we still have some uh, social distancing measures in place. Like if you ever take a train or you try to, uh, or if you do travel in Taiwan, you have to sit, you know, there, there's reserved seats to create distance. Um, and you still have to wear a mask everywhere. You get your temperature taken at every place you walk into. Uh, and they're already talking about taking some of those measures away because it's been over a month now since Taiwan has had any new cases. Um, not just, and it's been, I think, 12 or 13 days uh, since there have been any international cases brought in as well. So um, life, life is really normal here uh, in a world where it's abnormal almost everywhere else. We were looking at footage earlier, though, of the ceremony outside, and we saw that the lawn chairs were spread a little bit further apart than you normally would. So mm -hmm. I think certain, certain measures are still in place. Absolutely. I mean, they announced, uh, I think, uh, almost a month ago that they were going to have a socially distanced uh, inauguration. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, this entire pandemic has really taken day by day, week to week. So I'm sure when they started planning this entire inauguration, that was just that was the right thing to do. Uh, and I think it was also important uh, from an international perspective to show kind of what some of Taiwan's uh, social distancing, social distancing measures look like as a way to kind of demonstrate just, you know, how well Taiwan has been handling this. Right. Um, and before uh, the very end of uh, the president's uh, inaugural address, uh, she did say that uh, about the future, she did say the path ahead for us is long and we are about to begin a new chapter in Taiwan's story. Taiwan's story belongs to each and every one of us and it needs each and every one of us. So a very kind of warming a message from her to end her remark. Um, what do you expect to see in the next four years? Um, can you talk a little bit about the island's response maybe to the rising threat from Beijing? So, uh, you know, I think going off of what she said in her speech, uh, I don't expect Tsai herself to try to push for anything uh, that will actually destabilize relations more. I think we've seen this uh, since she came into office that uh, really the one who is making relations difficult between Taiwan and the PRC is the PRC. So for example, since Tsai Ing-wen came into office, uh, the PRC said they will not have any communication with the DPP, uh, which is very frustrating because the DPP keeps reaching out to say, let's have dialogue and it's the PRC side that is saying no. Um, but domestically, I think, you know, we should expect uh, four stable more years uh, because I think Tsai Ing-wen is really focused, especially in the given pandemic and really just kind of maintaining stability uh, and maintaining uh, a country that can continue to thrive in the way that it has in the last four years, mm -hmm. um, which has been uh, really successful. I mean, she also talked about this in her speech about how they're so focused on trying to work on economic growth. Uh, and how kind of well it's been going even just in the last few months since the pandemic started because ta Taiwan is one of the only functioning countries in the world right now. Uh, the economy is actually growing here. Um, probably the only place in the world that that's currently happening. Hmm. And how long have you love, lived in Taiwan? <laughs> um, so I first came here in 2012, uh, but I haven't been here since 2012. I, I come on and off depending on the time of the year. Um, so because my PhD is based in California, uh, I usually can only come here uh, for two or three months in the summer. Uh, but I was very fortunate to get a research grant through Fulbright, which allowed me to stay here for um, a year now. Uh, and because of the pandemic, I actually might be staying here uh, a little bit longer um, because uh, it's nicer here than it is in the U.S. at the moment. But we'll, yeah. we'll, I'm also taking it by a kind of a month to month uh, basis. And so can you give us some of your main takeaways, things you've learned since being in Taiwan? What were some surprises or, or learnings from you personally? Uh, I think the biggest uh, surprise that I always see whenever I'm here is just how incredibly active young people are in politics here. Uh, especially coming from America, um, where I, especially where, you know, where I live in America, Orange County. Uh, political participation, especially in young people, is just so low. Young people don't like to vote in America. Uh, young people don't really like to get out and protest very much. 
Um, but in Taiwan, there's such a history and such a kind of tradition of young people getting involved in politics. Uh, a big part of Taiwan's democratization was led by social movements, was uh, led by youth movements. Uh, and in the last five, six years, you see more and more young people getting involved in politics, which I think is just really, really cool and something that I wish uh, young people around the world, not just America, but young people around the world can look to Taiwan uh, and see how young people getting involved in politics does lead to actual difference. All right, sounds good. If there are no audience questions, let me just see if anybody has any for you, for us. Um, move beyond social distancing. Uh, perhaps this one. Uh, what's the what is root cause? cause? The global community still cannot move beyond social distancing. Um, so I, I think I can respond to maybe how Taiwan was able to get there very quickly. That'd be great. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, in 2003, Taiwan had the SARS crisis. Uh, mm -hmm. And the memory of SARS, it was 17 years ago, which might seem like a long time. Uh, but, you know, in Taiwan's historic memory, that's still really fresh. Uh, and people remember just kind of how scary that was uh, and kind of remember what was really needed by citizens and by the government in order to respond to that effectively. Uh, and, you know, even before SARS, there's always been uh, a kind of contemporary culture of wearing masks when you're sick, when you're of wearing masks when you don't want to, you know, when you're in kind of close quarters. So kind of the norm of wearing a mask, not strange here at all. In fact, it's totally normal. Uh, not only that, but ever since Taiwan democratized, there's been socialized health care here uh, since, since the 90s. Uh, and it's something that people not only enjoy, but it's something that they expect. So they expect that the government will step in and help during times of crisis. We learned that especially again from SARS. So, you know, how is Taiwan able to enact mask policies, social distancing policies so quickly and without kind of any sort of questioning or major pushback from civil society? Uh, it's because it's what Taiwanese people want from their government and it's what Taiwanese people expect from their government. Right. And we've talked before um, on Quick Take about the mass culture war about how in the U.S. it's so not normal to wear a mask outside, but I in know. India, you know, it's pretty normal. Um, it's you don't think twice about it. No, you don't. Here in Tokyo, people were wearing masks before coronavirus uh, took hold, so it definitely is is something different. And maybe the U.S. and maybe other parts of the West um, may start to feel more comfortable about it. It's not just for people. Who I really hope so. <laughs> I still, I'm still trying to convince my parents to wear a mask on the daily. Uh, it's. it's it's a challenge. It is a challenge. All right, cool. Thank you so much, Lev, for joining us today. That Thank wraps so things up for us here. Um, we had Lev Nachman joining us from Taiwan to answer the questions. And thank you all for watching. Make sure to follow us at Quick Take and at Business for the latest news and more. Bye for now.